In this SY3 screencast we're going to look at the role of pressure groups and there are three areas that we're going to look at in this presentation. Firstly we're going to define pressure groups and we're going to look at how they compare with political parties. Secondly we're going to explore some of the methods that pressure groups use and we're also going to evaluate some of the factors that make pressure groups successful and in the final part of the presentation we're going to use some theory to evaluate whether or not the growth in pressure group activity is a good thing or not. So let's begin with a simple definition. So we can define a pressure group as an organised group that aims to influence uh, the policies or actions of the government. And here we've got two examples of pressure groups that I'm sure you've heard of. Greenpeace, which tries to influence government policy on the environment. And Amnesty International, which tries to influence government policy on human rights. There are three main ways in which pressure groups and political parties differ. Firstly, pressure groups seek to influence the government from the outside. Whereas political parties are seeking to win power by putting up candidates in elections. Secondly pressure groups tend to have a much narrower uh, issue focus than political parties. So pressure groups will focus on a particular group or a particular issue, whereas political parties have to develop manifestos that encompass a broad range of issues. And then finally, the members of pressure groups might not share much in common apart from membership of a particular group or commitment to one particular issue whereas political parties tend to be composed of members who have shared preferences on a range of issues. As there are so many different types of pressure groups, it's helpful to put them into different categories. For example, one really important distinction is the distinction between interest groups and cause groups. So interest groups defend the interests of their members or a particular section of the society. So, for example, the National Union of Teachers is a trade union, and trade unions exist to defend the interests of a particular group of workers. Here we've got the CBI, which stands for the Confederation of British Industry, and this is a pressure group that represents the interests of business and employers in Britain. Uh, these interest groups, like the NUT, have a closed membership. So, to be a member of the National Union of Teachers, you obviously need to be in that particular profession. And a final common feature of interest groups is that members are motivated by material self-interest. So, for example, people join a trade union uh, to campaign for things like better pay and better conditions at work. In contrast, cause groups such as Friends of the Earth and the RSPB exist not to defend the interests of their members, to, but to promote a particular cause or issue that their members feel strongly about. And membership will be open to anybody who has a concern with that particular issue. And people join uh, these groups out of a kind of moral concern for a particular issue rather than advancing their own uh, self-interest. So groups like Friends of the Earth and the RSPB promote the issues of environmentalism and conservation. Another really important distinction to make when you're looking at pressure groups is this distinction between insider and outsider groups. And this is all about how close pressure groups are to the government. So insider groups are those groups that have uh, regular access to the government, so they're in kind of constant dialogue with the government. And a group like the CBI is in that type of position. It has the ear of the government. Outsider groups, in contrast, don't have that kind of access to uh, the government. Um, if you take a group like Greenpeace, for example, uh, because its goals and its tactics are perceived to be more radical than a group like the CBI, the government prefers to maintain its distance. And just one last thing to mention about different types of pressure groups. In a recent Politics Review article, Paul Fairclough argues that we are witnessing the rise of a new type of pressure group politics, which is far removed from the the kind of formal bureaucratic mass membership pressure groups. So he argues that in recent years we've seen an increase in more loosely organised campaign groups who are often part of broader uh, new social movements. 
And I think a group like UK Uncut, which campaigns on uh, corporate tax avoidance, is a really good example of what Fairclough is talking about, this kind of loosely organised campaign group. And I think that groups like UK Uncut are very much a product of the internet age. So new technologies have made it far easier to campaign without the kind of formal uh, bureaucratic pressure group organisation and structure that was once considered essential to success. OK, let's move on to have a look at what pressure groups actually do. Let's look at the methods that they use to influence the government before going on to look at the factors that might make them successful or not. Now, as you can see in this diagram, there are a range of different tactics that pressure groups might use. Uh, insider groups often don't need to do very much because they have regular access to the government anyway. So they have the ear of the government. They don't need to get the media on their side or to mobilise public opinion. In fact, some insider groups might prefer to operate quietly behind the scenes without that type of scrutiny. Uh, pressure groups that have a lot of money had the advantage of possibly hiring a professional lobbyist. Now, these are people who have perhaps worked in politics before, who are selling their contacts and their knowledge of the political system uh, to pressure groups. One type of method that has probably increased in recent years is the use of direct action. And this often involves pressure groups um, mobilising their members to take part in mass acts of civil disobedience to draw attention to uh, a particular issue or cause. So in this picture we can see uh, a demonstration from a couple of years ago uh, organised by the UK Uncut group where they blocked Westminster Bridge uh, to campaign against the uh, government NHS bill. So what kind of things help to make pressure group action effective? Well firstly this issue of direct action. Uh, direct action can be very successful sometimes if it uh, generates positive media coverage but there's always the danger that it might backfire and that you might alienate public opinion by engaging in actions which are obstructive. Uh, the size of the membership obviously matters. If you've got more members you can probably raise more money, you can get more people writing letters to MPs and so forth. Uh, the status, as I mentioned before, of the pressure group is important, so insider groups uh, are often much more effective than outsider groups because of the access that they have. And then obviously uh, being in tune with public opinion is often a prerequisite for a successful pressure group campaign. And control over media images is also really important in influencing the success of pressure group campaigns. So, for example, in 1995, the British government controversially granted Shell, uh, the oil company, a licence to dump the Brent Spa uh, oil storage structure over the edge of the continental shelf in the North Atlantic. And activists from the environmental pressure group Greenpeace tried to prevent this from happening by trying to occupy the Brent Spa as it was towed into the Atlantic. And all of this was filmed by Greenpeace ships. And their film included scenes of a Greenpeace helicopter being attacked with water cannons uh, by the shell vessels. And as no television companies were prepared to charter ships, the only images available of this confrontation were those provided by Greenpeace. Uh, and this played to a kind of David and Goliath type storyline. Pictures of a plucky little helicopter flying into a barrage of water cannons were broadcast by television channels throughout Europe uh, and played very well for Greenpeace. OK, we're going to finish this presentation by considering this last question. Uh, has the growth in pressure group activity actually been a good thing? And there certainly has been uh, an astonishing rate of growth in the formation of pressure groups since the 1960s, but sociologists are not agreed about whether or not the exponential growth in pressure groups has been a good or a bad thing for democracy. The perspective that's the most positive about pressure groups is the pluralist perspective, and pluralists such as Truman argue that pressure groups are the very stuff of the democratic process. They're one of the key things that makes democracy work. So the argument that pluralists like Truman are making is that pressure groups are actually essential to democracy. They provide lots of opportunities for people to participate in politics. 
and for a range of different viewpoints to be represented. And pluralists believe that there is an equilibrium in group activity based upon this idea of countervailing power. So yes, there are some pressure groups that represent big business, such as the CBI, but their power and influence over politics is balanced out by the power of other types of pressure groups representing different sections of society, such as the trade union movement. And according to pluralism, numerous pressure groups compete for influence over the government, but the government acts as a kind of umpire, as an honest broker, and tends to make decisions that represent a broad range of interests, rather than consistently favouring one type of pressure group. In complete contrast to the pluralist perspective, we've got the Marxist perspective on pressure groups. And Marxists would argue that the pressure groups that represent uh, the interests of business and finance exercise the most influence. So they're more likely to be the insider groups, they're more likely to have the finances to pay for uh, professional lobbyists, and therefore their voice is heard much more than other types of pressure groups. A different type of criticism of pressure groups comes from those of a new right or neoliberal persuasion. And their argument is that pressure groups can make societies more difficult to govern. And the argument here is that pressure groups might create uh, an array of vested interests that are able to block government initiatives and make policy unworkable. And I think it's the trade union movement that the new right have been particularly critical of. And they argue that this situation, which they call hyperpluralism, can also undermine good economic policy by forcing up public spending and increasing state intervention, which are, of course, are the types of policies that the new right are opposed to.